Hello, I'm Rajesh Merchandani, and thanks for joining me for the CGD podcast. Now, imagine your panic or your frustration if you were to lose, say, your passport or your driver's license. For many of us, they are basic proof of identity, and they allow us to access a huge range of services from, say, getting on a plane or uh, opening a bank account or being able to prove that you are entitled to education or to vote. But now spare a thought for some 2 billion people, mainly in the developing world, for whom that isn't even an option because they have no legal identity. And that includes around 650 million children who have not been registered at birth. They do not legally exist. What chance in life do they then have? It's a huge obstacle to development and it has been recognised by the Sustainable Development Goals. They include a specific one on identification. Now my guests today have been studying identification and development and they argue that actually ID is critical in achieving several of the Sustainable Development Goals. Mariana Dehan from the World Bank and Alan Gelb, Senior Fellow here at CGD, have authored a paper together on it. It's available on our website and they both join me in the podcast studio today. Guys, welcome. Very nice to have you here. Thank you, Rajesh. Mariana, let's start with you and let's talk a little bit about the problem. Uh, the numbers that I was talking about in, in the introduction of people without legal identity, they seem staggering. Take us through the numbers a little bit. How is it so many and where are they concentrated? Thank you. And indeed, you're right. These are huge numbers. And the fact that so many people do not legally exist makes difficult for us to even know how many they are, right? Data does not exist for us to be able to count them. But we conducted some research and we look at the data that we have, we make some estimates, and we realize that there are more than two billion people in the world who today lack a form of recognized ID document. And this number includes children who have not been registered at birth, and we qualify children from zero to 14 years of age, but also adults, and mostly women who for difficult social, contextual uh, circumstances didn't get an access to ID. So we believe that this problem disproportionately affects women and children in the developing world. And we have some good indication that uh, these people come from poor rural areas in Africa and uh, South Asia mostly. And Alan, uh, it's more than just the notion of having an ID as a right in itself. Mm -hmm. It's also an obstacle to engaging in many parts of society that you and I would take for granted. Yes, that's right, Rajesh. We identified at least 10 of the sustainable development goals and targets uh, where, you know, without people having ID, it is very difficult to see how these goals and targets can be achieved. For example, there is a target on uh, disasters, disasters relief. How do you deliver relief from disasters which destroy people's homes? Uh, you know, they need means of support, they need funds for reconstruction. Uh, and there are examples of programs that use very highly developed uh, identification programs to target relief very effectively to these people. Another example is uh, social protection. There is a, a, a sustainable development goal on social protection. And right now, there are around uh, four or 500 million people in developing countries who are getting some form of transfer. Again, these transfers, whether to ordinary people or to refugees, are far easier to make and far more precise if the transfers can be directly to people. So you can trace the entire transfer right down from the entity that provides it right down to the person who receives it. So those are some of the examples. There are others on financial access, on gender equity. Um, we have a number. Mariana, any more you can add to that? I think as uh, Alan mentioned, there are at least 10 clusters of, of um, uh, sustainable development goals that can be enabled if um, a right and robust mean of identification is put in place. But when we looked with a second look at the um, what is called now 2030 Agenda, we realize that almost every target needs a form of identification for someone to be able to access that right, that service. So I actually think we should have a second <laughs> chance to, to read and go beyond yeah. those. 
almost every target. Hmm. So, I mean, some of them, there's 169 targets. Absolutely. And some of them, you know, have been, some would question them being in there. Many have said there's too many targets. Um, I mean, things like sustainable tourism is one of them. So there's, a, there's an identity component to that. How can you travel without an identity document? And how can you control all the cross-border migration that we have? That's another area that can be aided through a form of identification. And you mentioned it earlier, one of the kind of key goals, I suppose, is uh, gender equality. How important is identity for that? Well, uh, it, it uh, appears that a woman who doesn't have a valid form of identification cannot assert her own rights, but also cannot access property, cannot claim the right to divorce and then to inherit uh, whatever she is entitled to as part of, of the marriage she was uh, uh, participating. So indeed, uh, a woman needs an ID to also vote and to also access educational opportunities, economic opportunities, financial inclusion. So I really see identification as a red thread through the entire 2030 agenda. And there's also some examples, aren't there? I think it's in Malawi of an identification system. Is it at a bank where uh, the identifier is, uh, is it a woman's thumbprint so that a man can't claim the assets? Yes. um, There is a bank, Opportunity International, in Malawi, which is quite a big bank. It's um, about um, 500,000 clients. And one of the things they do is they identify their clients uniquely through fingerprints when they enroll. And they have to be able to present that in order to access funds. And they found that, uh, for example, when a woman's husband dies, um, the relatives uh, may want to come and claim the assets that she has. but they're unable to get the financial assets because they cannot, even if they take her savings book or, you know, they they can't get it without her own uh, participation, without her fingerprints. So that bank, not surprisingly, has a lot of women clients. If identification is crucial to, as you say, almost all of the SDG targets, does that make the target on identification more important than the others? Well, I certainly believe that if the targets are in the 2030 agenda, all of them have equal right to be there. All of them are important. However, I see some targets can act as enablers to others, and that is not the case for every target, but certainly it is for target 16.9. Let's talk a little bit about uh, children. We mentioned at the beginning that some 650 million children around the world have not been registered at birth. Um, Is birth registration enough to solving the problems of not having identity? I think, you know, by the way, I should mention uh, there are many more children who have been registered at birth but don't actually have birth certificates. So children are often registered, but then they don't receive a certificate, so they can't prove that they've been registered. Uh. And often it's very difficult to find records of birth registrations in registries because they're not being kept very well. So there are problems actually that go beyond simple birth registration. So you could address that and you could register every child at birth and give them Mm. a birth certificate. Mm. Would that solve the problems of identification or or are there different things Mm. here that we need to think about? No, I think one has to go further. And one of the problems we see is that in many countries the birth registration process is not properly integrated into an identification process which matters more as people grow older. So in many countries, for example, um, there is a break in the identification system between birth registration and what we could call national registration or civil identification. And sometimes that has to fill in for birth registration that hasn't happened. But even if you have birth registration, at some point later on, usually around 15, 17, something like that, Uh, a well-working system will provide credentials for people that they can use as an adult. Because, I mean, anyone can present a birth certificate, but how do you know that this is the person referred to on the certificate? Mm. So that's not enough alone, and there have been many cases of a birth certificate fraud. Mm. And so the work you've been doing 
mm. uh, has been also looking, amongst other things, at the use of biometric identification yes. to actually have a secure way of identifying people. I know you went up to Indonesia earlier in the year and you brought yeah. some great pictures back with you of kids yeah. being registered. registered yes. So so tell us a little bit yeah. then, both of you in fact, about what your work mm. has shown or is showing that can be done to address the problem and, and what is being done. Okay, well. Um, yes, I have been looking at biometric identification for several years and how it's being used in developing countries. And of course, you know, it, it's, not, it's not the complete answer. Nothing on its own is a complete answer. But it is a very useful technology, especially when you don't have very well organized civil registries. And uh, that's one reason why it's being used in countries almost like leapfrogging countries that don't have uh, a strong infrastructure of traditional registries are able to establish an identification baseline. And people can then be authenticated against their credential very directly. Uh, or, as in the case of India, even with their system, there's no credential at all. They're just uh, authenticated against their iris scans or their fingerprints. So it's a very useful technology indeed. and. Um, Almost, I would say almost all of the new systems which are going in now, which have been going in over the last 10 years, have used it in some way or another. Uh, and Mariana, you've been mm. uh, a core part of mm. uh, you know, a broad range of work that the World Bank mm. has been doing in this area. It's a lending program called uh, ID4 Development, ID4D. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, indeed. Uh, at the World Bank, we've launched last year the Identification for Development Agenda, and it was for us a way to conceptualize a coherent approach to how should we address the specific target in the Sustainable Development Goals Agenda, and also how can we help uh, client countries address uh, this problem in their countries. Uh, first, I think what we tried to convey as a message to the international donor community and then the broader stakeholders is to understand, like Alan just mentioned, that uh, the target as it is stated today conflates two different, though uh, similar notions, but with uh, distinct applications, birth registration and legal identity. And that sometimes there is a disconnect in client countries where in between two different registration processes, which happens in many of our client mm -hmm. countries, could be a disconnect, and millions of people can go through that gap so that we don't know what is their status, what opportunities can they access, what healthcare, education, etc. So we tried to um, convey this message through the usual processes of consultations that uh, have taken place in shaping up the um, uh, Agenda 2030. And we were happy that uh, the goal has been endorsed by the majority of the stakeholders. Right now we are in the process of figuring out uh, the core indicators to measure progress. And while there is a very clear understanding on um, what should be the indicator to measure birth registration in countries, there is almost none on the side of the legal identity and how should countries approach this. So we've created at the World Bank a working group that includes membership from 12 different entities and you know the bank is a very big institution with more than 12 thousand people. So it is really uh, unique that uh, so many different global practices, entities of the World Bank have rallied uh, behind this agenda to come up with a shared vision, common understanding. And then that is something that we would like our client countries to mirror as well. We'd like them to set up structures like that in their agencies, governmental agencies, other stakeholders participating, so that there are uh, more people involved in the process, aware of it, and then participating. Mm -hmm. So the lending that we are able to provide then would ensure that we are not funding siloed uh, initiatives or something that is built in a very fragmented, disparate way. We would like to help set up a platform that would be an identification system supporting 
foundational restoration, but also functional uses, uh, meaning multi-sectoral applications of, of the ideas, so that um, there is a, a real uh, use of, of the investment made and mm, real benefit to the people in the end. You talked about how um, the World Bank program on ID 4D, ID for Development, is cross-cutting across global, global practices, which is, I guess, a recognition of the importance of identification in many areas of development. But I want to get a sense from both of you, um, what progress is being made? I mean, Mariana, you also mentioned that you know, there aren't really any good indicators for how do you measure uh, legal identity. Mm. So what progress is being made? I mean, is this a losing battle or are we winning it? Oh. No, I certainly don't think it's a losing battle at all. So what has happened is that many more countries have introduced uh, ID programs or are strengthening their ID programs. And um, judging by the number of programs and probably by the number of people covered, if you take, for example, just what is happening in India with the Aadhaar program, which from nothing several years ago has registered, what, 920, 930 million people. Uh, a country like Uganda has developed an ID program very rapidly. So there are examples. And I think if one look, has data for time, you will see the number is going up. But the important thing now is to make sure that investment is well used and integrated into, the, into programs so that uh, it helps people to have bank accounts, for example. It perhaps helps to monitor credit through credit bureaus, which is another use of this, so that uh, you can strengthen the financial system. Uh, and so it's not just um, creating it, it's making sure that it's used. And I certainly don't think it's a losing battle because countries are making progress. If policymakers are listening to this, what is your key takeaway for them? What should they take away from this, mm. on the whole ID SDG debate, Mariana? Well, if I had to be brief, um, I would just say that uh, the problem at hand today is less the lack of uh, implication and more the lack of focus. And if the policy makers, together with the development community, would just focus their efforts towards the attainment of uh, this SDG target, then we can certainly succeed. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I would say planning. You, one has to think about this strategically as a foundation for all aspects of economic activity and also for many areas of policy. You know, you want to manage the public payroll. You want to make sure that teachers are paid. Uh, you want to make sure that transfers are received by the people who are supposed to receive them. Or you want to make sure that your people can travel internationally. So how do you think about this in an integrated way and how do you use the resources which you have, your own resources, resources from the international community, how do you use them to achieve these goals? So I would like it to be a goal-driven approach towards providing this uh, for all kinds of applications. Okay, yeah. Mariana, Alan, great to have you both in the studio here. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank, Thank you, Roger. And you can find out much more about uh, CGD's work on identification and the SDGs and the paper that Mariana and Alan have written together is on our website as well. It's at cgdev.org. And don't forget to join me, Rajesh Merchandani, for the next podcast from the Centre for Global Development. Mm -hmm.